as you're taking your Bibles and turning back to that portion of Scripture which we read just a moment ago, let me just say a few words. As you're aware, yesterday was the third attack in England by terrorists. Very interesting to be on the eve of an election. Cowards who kill innocent people and when they can't afford the big stuff, the stuff they can't afford like vehicles, they run people over and stab them. Why do they do it? Do you really want to understand that mentality? If you think of Islam as a religion, you're only one third right. Islam is also a political system, very, very strong political system with very definitive laws that have not changed over the centuries and which are enforced in every country where Islam has ascendancy. And every country where at one point in history Islam had ascendancy, even if they have later lost it, they consider it still to be theirs and their responsibility is to regain it. But Islam is not merely a religion or a religious system. It's not merely a political system, but it is also a military system. Entire military structure. People who think only of Islam as a religion and buy into the patent lie that it is a peaceful religion or that there is such thing as a moderate Muslim do not understand Islam. It is religious, it is political, and it is military. It is required that all Muslims be engaged in a military struggle. Terrorism is part of the military struggle. The Lord willing, not this coming Wednesday, but a week from Wednesday, we'll be starting a series on Christianity versus Islam with a brilliant scholar by the name of William Federer who will explain the military history and conquests of Islam and how it has penetrated even into regions such as China. You may not be aware of that, but into India, of course you know, into the Philippines and into Indonesia, which has the largest Muslim population in the world, into Africa, into other countries across Europe, as it's doing now, into Russia, into Poland, into Hungary, into Czechoslovakia, into Romania. <laughs> Are you aware that Vlad the Impaler from Romania actually was known as the Impaler because he impaled Muslims on stakes just like the Muslims did. And it was from him that we got the legend of Dracula. <laughs> You'll learn a lot of things if you come on Wednesday evenings. I strongly encourage you to be here so that you will understand what is happening not only in Europe but in the United States. Everything from the World Trade Center to the bombing yesterday in London. Please be with us on Wednesday evenings. We finish up our current series on why does the gate, the counterfeit Christian movements that have permeated the church, and the following week we begin Christianity versus Islam. You need to be here Wednesday evenings, 7 p.m. You need to know this stuff so that you can protect yourself, your children, and your grandchildren. You need to be here Wednesday evenings. Now, please, take your Bibles and turn over to Exodus chapter 15. Did you know there's something that relates to Islam and Santa Claus? Oh, you're going to have to wait and see. <laughs> Exodus, chapter 15. Very important passage of scripture because it deals with music. And as we'll point out a little bit later, music is a rather essential thing in major portions of the Bible. Now, the last time that we were in Exodus was May 21st because, of course, last week was Memorial Day Sunday. So where we left off was with point number nine, that God is glorified when believers bear the fruit of the Spirit. 
And that's a good place to test the fruit of the music that you listen to. Does the music you love and listen to motivate you or anybody for that matter to bear the fruit of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Or does it instead motivate the flesh and motivate all the old sin nature to do the works of the flesh? Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of which I tell you before, as I've told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Does your music motivate you to bear the fruit of the Spirit? That's the heart of the matter because... Music is one of the principal tools in the spiritual war, and we're going to talk about music and warfare a little bit later in this message. It is a key in spiritual warfare, and did you know even the United States military understands the power of music in war? And I'm not just talking about John Philip Sousa marches. I'm talking about using music as a weapon of war. Did you know our government has actually done that? Do you think the devil doesn't know how to do it? That's for later. It's one of the principal tools in the spiritual war because God designed music to motivate and empower your spirit to godly Christian living. The devil has perverted music so that it will stimulate and empower your flesh to wickedness and to evil thoughts. No, not just thoughts, to evil words and to evil actions as well. Number 10, God was glorified when we're exercising our spiritual gifts. And we pointed out that spiritual gifts are not the same thing as the fruit of the spirit. But we find that in the spiritual gifts, Peter talks about using the gifts for the glory of God through Jesus Christ. And that, of course, again, applies to the issue of Christian contemporary music. Does it motivate people to exercise the permanent gifts of evangelist, pastor, teacher, evangelist, helps, government, self, control, etc.? Or does it stimulate the flesh to imitate and practice the temporary gifts? of prophet and apostle and healings and miracles and tongues and interpretation of tongues and the gift of knowledge, which was the reception of new special revelation before the close of the canon of the New Testament. On Wednesday evening, we've been looking at how people are motivated in the flesh to imitate all those gifts and they writhe on the floor like snakes and they pile up in heaps and wiggle on top of each other. That is not the spirit of God, that is the flesh. Number 12, we saw that God is glorified in the work of our Lord Jesus Christ. We saw that he is glorified in thanksgiving to God. We saw God is glorified when believers patiently suffer for Christ. We saw that God is glorified through the keeping of his promises. And all of this relates to doing all to the glory of God. That includes your music. So the music should do each of those things. It should fill your heart with thanksgiving to God. It should move you to a life filled with holiness and purity. It's something that should bring glory to God through the keeping of his promises. God will be glorified in the believers when Christ comes at the rapture. 2 Thessalonians 1.10, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed. Does the music you listen to make you passionately yearn for the return of Christ? 16, those who covet the glory of God for themselves or refuse to glorify him are under his wrath. And that was certainly true of the musical being Lucifer and should be a clear warning signal when you see or hear certain so-called Christian musical artists basking in their own glory and grinning like idiots idiots as they accept the audience applause. It all started with Satan, the rebellious angel, the most musical being God ever created, the angel who coveted the glory for himself and is now under extreme judgment and will end in hell, guaranteed. He has no options out. You do. The devil doesn't. We see that in Isaiah 14, Ezekiel chapter 28. Obviously, you can apply that to musicians today. Why do we balk at applying the principle of bringing glory to God through our music that we use in our worship? Not the way we think of glory to God, but how God has defined it. We saw 16 different precise and specific areas in which we are to bring all glory to God and those apply to music. Why do we leave that out? Now, today we're starting something new. As a corollary topic, let me just touch briefly on our adversary, the devil, who wants you to listen to the wrong kind of music. Because I want to talk about music and war, or music and warfare. Remember, I'm not just talking about, you know, 
marches that get you all patriotic and feel good, like John Philip Sousa's marches, uh, Stars and Stripes Forever. I mean, that does, you know, pump up your blood and get you marching and grinning and thinking good about your country and all. That's not the only thing we're talking about. Music can be used as a military weapon. Weapon. The devil knows that principle. He's using it as a military weapon against Christians in the great spiritual war, the long war against God. Now, some of you, <laughs> I see some of you are frowning. <laughs> I see some frowns on some faces out there. Uh, you don't believe that music can be used as a military weapon. It's like you're saying to me, military weapon? Prove it. Okay, let me give you an illustration. I think probably some of you follow the news, and you're probably aware that this past week, on May 29, 2017, Manuel Noriega died at the age of 83. That's exciting news, did you know it? Because it proves my point. How many of you remember Manuel Noriega? A few, okay, I'm glad you do. Some of you have blank stares, <laughs> uh, indicating that you probably don't know who that was. Manuel Antonio Noriega Moreno was a political and military officer from Panama. He ruled as a dictator from 1983 to 1989 when the United States invaded Panama and captured him. Some of you probably don't even remember that the United States actually invaded, with a military invasion, invaded Panama. George H.W. Bush was president at the time. The U.S. invasion of Panama was launched on December 20th, 1989, after months of planning. 23 American troops and three American civilians were killed in the invasion. 150 Panamanian troops and 500 civilians were killed. On December 29th, 1989, the United Nations General Assembly said they didn't like us. They voted, of course they usually don't, they voted 75 to 20 with 40 abstentions to denounce the invasion as a willful violation of international law, even though 92% of the Panamanian adults supported the U.S. invasion. Many w wished that the U.S. had invaded earlier. Now, question. Why did the U.S. invade Panama, and what does that have to do with music? Beginning in the 1950s, Noriega worked closely with the CIA and was considered one of their most valuable intelligence sources. He was also one of the primary channels for smuggling illegal weapons and military equipment and cash to the U.S.-backed counterinsurgency forces in Central America and in South America. The problem was, however, that Noriega was also one of the most notorious cocaine traffickers in the world. And the CIA knew this, but they overlooked it because of his usefulness. When he was captured, he was flown to the United States as a prisoner of war, not merely as a drug smuggler. He was flown to the United States as a prisoner of war and uh, given a very, very plush uh, cell. He was tried on eight counts of drug trafficking, racketeering, and money laundering in April of 1992. In September of that year, he was sentenced to 40 years in prison, which was later reduced to 30 years. He finished his sentence in 2007 and was extradited to France, where he had been convicted in absentia of murder in 1995 and money laundering in 1999. He was there sentenced to seven years in prison, but was extradited to Panama. A lot of countries had a beef against him and there to serve 20 years. He died in the hospital in Panama City on May 29, 2017, two weeks after brain surgery. Of interest in our current national political debate, Noriega voided the election results in his campaign for political office, claiming that there had been, quote, foreign interference. Have you heard that recently? Foreign interference in the election, a theme that was picked up and Trump thumped by Hillary Clinton at that time, and a theme which has resurfaced in the current witch hat to try to find foreign interference in the Trump election. Mrs. Clinton may have been dipping into her old playbook, remembering the effectiveness of this foreign interference claim. Like the Bible says, there is nothing new under the sun. But back to music. 
the news today, even of the past, teaches us some things. Back to music. On the fifth day of the invasion, Noriega and four other supporters took sanctuary in the Roman Catholic Apostolic Nunciatur, the Vatican's embassy in Panama. Noriega threatened to escape to the jungles and lead a guerrilla warfare movement if he was not given a refuge, so the Monsignor Laboa let him in. The United States could not enter the embassy because the U.S. had made a treaty with the Vatican, which is actually a city-state nation just like the other nations of the world. Military invasion of an embassy is a declaration of war on that nation. So what did the United States do to force Noriega to come out? After erecting a barrier completely around the Vatican embassy, U.S. military implemented what they called, I love this title, this was called Operation Nifty Package. Operation Nifty Package. What was the principal tool used by Operation Nifty Package? Unless you actually remember, you're not going to believe this. The United States military erected huge speakers pointed at the embassy that blared out rock music at the embassy for 10 days, 24 hours per day. Finally, weak and shaken after the barrage of mind and body numbing music for 10 days, Noriega surrendered on January 3rd, 1990, was incarcerated as a prisoner of war, and then was taken to the United States. The United States government understands not only that music can be used as a military weapon, but they have actually done it. It seems that the only willfully ignorant Christians refuse to admit the danger of wrong music and want to claim that music is not a weapon. Only willfully ignorant Christians seem to be in the crowd that says that any kind of music is good as long as the composer and the performers are sincere. That's like the various head-in-the-sand ostrich types that are sincerely wrong about the political and military nature of Islam and now are sincerely dead. I've told you earlier how police in the 1960s used the various hippie, at the, during the various hippie demonstrations and left-wing campus riots used speaker systems blurring out certain frequencies that made everyone in their path need to go to the restroom. Do you think that Satan, the most musical creature ever created, does not know the power of music in military maneuvers? Do you think that he does not know how to use it in his military attacks on Christians? It is a war, people. The Bible calls it a war. You're a soldier in the war. You're supposed to wear the armor of God. In Ephesians chapter 6, you are supposed to do battle with the enemy. Do you think that the devil does not know how to use the wrong music in his military attacks on Christian young people to turn their hearts and minds away from the living God and to turn their hearts and minds and bodies and emotions over to him? Let me give you one final postscript on Noriega. While he was in prison, he claimed that he accepted Christ through the ministry of a pastor who was allowed to talk to him for six hours. We won't know for sure until we get to heaven. Indeed, he was truly a bad actor. But remember, Christ came into the world to save sinners. We'll only know in eternity. I hope you understand the reality and the power of the illustration that I've just given you. As the enemy of God, Satan wants the glory. And right now he controls the glory of earth. The devil hates it when Christians give glory to God and use music that truly glorifies God. Satan craves the glory because he currently has glory all over the earth. We learn about that from the narratives in Matthew and Luke. Matthew chapter 4. When Jesus was led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted forty days and forty nights, he was afterward and hungered. Again the devil taketh him up to an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them and saith unto him, All these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down 
and worship me. The devil could give that secondary glory to Jesus if Jesus worshiped the devil because then Jesus would be glorifying the devil and all that glory would come back to the devil. Luke gives further information about it in Luke chapter 4 beginning in verse 5. And the devil taking him up into a high mountain showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will I give it. Do you wonder how certain people, like Noriega, for example, got into power? If you look at a picture of him, he, he doesn't look like a great big, huge, six foot, eight inch, tall, strong man, chewing on a cigar and wearing a Castro hat. He's a wheezing, tiny, squiggly little guy. The devil gives power to whom he will. Have you ever wondered how certain politicians made it into office? How certain people get control of companies and certain other people get control of other things? How in the world did he do it? We have a hint here. All this power will I give thee and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will, I give it. Now God is sovereign. God overrules. God can step in and stop the devil's plans at any time, but for the most part, Satan is in charge. He's called the prince of the power of the air. He's the one who is in control of most of the hearts of men and women all over the earth. Christians are not a majority. Christians are a minority, genuine Christians. The devil controls the rest. And he has a huge force of demonic hosts that are out there doing his bidding and working together as a military structure. And you see that in the specific Greek terms that are used by Paul, where we wrestle not against flesh and blood, against principalities and powers and rulers in the darkness and so on over in Ephesians chapter 6. Different military terms are used for those. Different echelons, different orders of power in the warfare that Satan has against God. He controls most of the earth. It is only the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, that restrains the devil from going as far as he could. But at the rapture, the restraining influence of the Spirit of God will be removed and Satan will motivate people to be just as bad as they possibly can and that gives a vacuum for the Antichrist to step in and take control. It's coming, people. Oh, if we would only understand. And Satan goes on, If thou wilt therefore worship me, all shall be thine. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. You know, ultimately, the devil himself is going to fulfill the purpose of giving glory to God. Because the Bible tells us that every knee shall bow before Jesus, including the knees of the devil. Things in heaven, things in earth, and things under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I suspect that that will also include the devil's musical gifts and he'll be forced to produce music that gives glory to God. The one thing he doesn't want to do, but his knee will bend and he will give glory to God. Now you all know verse 11, which I just quoted to you in Philippians 2, but let me read it to you in context. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant. How different from the devil's approach. And was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself. How different from the devil. And became obedient. How different from the devil. Unto death, even the death of the cross. You've heard me say it before. The way up is down. The way up is down. The death of the cross, wherefore God hath highly exalted him. There's the going up. He had to go down first. The way up is down. Say it with me. The way up is down. Again, the way up is down. I don't hear very much enthusiasm out there. We don't like that, do we? The way up is down. Only when we humble ourselves, not push forward in our own arrogance and pride and strife and wanting to be first and wanting our way and not God's way, 
God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. The way up is down. Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The one from the highest went down to the lowest and therefore has been exalted even higher. Every tongue will confess. But now a question for you. How many of you know that this truth is specifically stated in the Old Testament as well, and the same Old Testament passage is quoted again by Paul in the book of Romans? Listen to it out of Isaiah. I have sworn by myself, the word is gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return. God says, I said it, it's going to happen. It shall not return, that unto me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear. That's Isaiah 45, 23. Paul's quoting it there in Philippians, but he also quotes it over in Romans chapter 14. For it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. You know, when something is stated in the Old Testament and quoted at least twice in the New Testament, it's a principle we ought to learn. Now let's go directly to the New Testament, the discussion of music we find there, as well as the controlling principles. There are two places in the New Testament that tell us about a variety of types of music that are appropriate for worship in the church. Paul breaks the categories down like this. This is Ephesians chapter 5, 19, and I'll read right after it, Colossians 3, 16. Those are your two places, Ephesians 5, Colossians 3. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, Singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. That's Ephesians 5. Colossians 3.16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. What's the point I'm trying to make? I think you would be hard put to legitimately fit most Christian contemporary music into any of those categories. Psalms, hymns, or spiritual songs. I think it's impossible to fit trash like so-called Christian hard rock, Christian punk rock, Christian acid rock, and all the rest of the non-Christian music forms that promoters pompously offer with a straight face into the legitimate worship forms of psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Tell me, is punk rock a psalm, a hymn, or a spiritual song? Is punk rock or acid rock a psalm, a hymn, or a spiritual song? In godly music, the emphasis is on the melody, which is stated specifically in that verse, making melody in your heart to the Lord. Melody should be the dominant basic element over harmony and rhythm. So when you're listening to a song, ask yourself, does the music have a true melody? Or is it a truncated, limited melody line with overpowering drums and static loud harmony? Yesterday I was up around 4.30, 5 o'clock in the morning, and uh, I was listening to the news radio, and they were doing a, a, a section on some kind of music that I don't even remember what it's called now. It's a new form of music that's out there. And they were just reveling in the fact that the guy who was singing it only used two chords through the entire thing, which lasted like 10 minutes, and only used two chords and just, just wailed a little different on some of them and used a little different rhythm, but it was only two. And that's called music? And they were all excited. This is really cool. Dear people, that's not biblical music. That's not the kind of music that brings glory to God. It'll put you into a trance, but it won't bring glory to God. Both Ephesians 5 and Colossians 3 emphasize singing. Is the melodious line in the music you like adaptable to singing? Or is it like rap music that isn't sung, where the so-called artist just vomits out the words like machine gun fire? Does the music manifest grace in your heart? 
The unmerited favor of God to you as a sinner when it is sung. The music itself. The heart is the part of you that the scripture connects to your spirit. Not connecting with your soul and body, but to your spirit. These are all key elements of biblically legitimate music. I can't believe our time is up. Well, I'm going to read one more paragraph to you, and then we're going to cut it there because we have the Lord's table today. But let me ask the question. Is the current genera of contemporary Christian music really divine worship, or is it strange fire? When screaming, foul-mouthed, tattooed, and pierced young people who fornicate with their fans on tour in hotel orgies, who wear orange and green mohawk hairdos, who wail freaky grunts on their electric steel guitars under pulsing strobe lights, who pop out their bare chests from their open studded leather jackets, while stupid little teenage groupies wiggle in an orgiastic shiver to the pounding beat while they wave their hands and scream and go into a trance. Is that divine worship? Or is it strange fire? Give me a break. That is not divine worship. That's Baal worship. Gracious Heavenly Father, we pray for your blessings upon your word, and we pray that you will teach us the power of music to glorify Christ and to edify the body of Christ, not to tear down the body of Christ, not to make the body of Christ susceptible to the devil's poisons, not to let us get infected with stuff that then warps our thinking on all areas of the Christian life filling us with compromise and lackadaisical sloth, dulling our senses to the spiritual war that's going on around us, making us contented prisoners in the concentration camps the devil loves to set up for Christians and calling them youth concerts. Father, help us to be wise, make us discerning, make us faithful, Make us obedient. Cause us to learn what your word says about the scripture. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.